everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, the topic is very broad, but uh, I think we'll get through at least two use cases. Um, so I think what we can try and do is we can talk. To, we can start off with uh, Jalak. You've got in, interested in Bitcoin in 2013, and you started investing through your VC firm in 2014. So a pretty long time by crypto standards. How have the pitches that you've seen, those use cases, how have those things evolved from, from then till now? What are you seeing these days? Yeah, it's, it's like 20 years of evolution in, in just five years, I feel. Um, uh, in 2013, 2014, I mean, it was really about Bitcoin uh, payments as a use case. So BitPesa, Abra um, were investments of mine. And then I also invested a lot in more of the underlying infrastructure. So Blockstream is an example, Block Cipher, an example. Um, I looked at kind of what needed to be put into place before we can start building applications on the promise of this technology. And then um, we, we had the ICO boom. <laughs> um, I mean, we, I, I got into the space before Ether had ICO'd, and that was like the first you know, major token generation um, event. And then uh, last year, we just saw you know, thousands of cryptos uh, being issued. So I'd say the business models have evolved a great deal as we're getting more and more into like the application layer mm -hmm. of um, and and kind of thousands of use cases. Now I think we still need a lot of infrastructure build out till we can see the promise of these applications. But it's a lot more variety and mm -hmm. and, and and a lot more global. Well, one of those uh, ICOs uh, was yours, uh, Chris, and 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 you're working in payments, right? So kind of an old school use case for crypto. You have a a debit card, right, issued from by Visa, um, but but how how what is going on there? Is there is there something new? Is there a twist to what you're offering with Monaco? Absolutely. So um, our vision is to put cryptocurrency in every wallet. So we are starting with something that customers around the world understand very well. Uh, it's a it's a debit card. It's a prepaid card, uh, and it's connected to the Monaco app where you can buy crypto, you can exchange it, you can track what's going on in the market, you can send it to your friends. Uh, very easily. So we spent a lot of time solving problems of accessibility, like getting people to actually enter the market, making it really uh, easy to use. And, and user experience design is another fundamental challenge that all of us in this space need to solve. Because right now, getting in, into crypto is difficult. Uh, it's sometimes intimidating with you know, wallets, uh, uh, transaction hashes, uh, private keys. It's not really ready for uh, prime time in the market, and we view our role in this ecosystem as uh, as, as those guys who solve the problems and, and make products for for the mass market consumer to make this vision of cryptocurrency in every wallet a reality. Now, this is a consumer app, but uh, similarly, as we try to build it, and we've been doing this now for two years, uh, we discovered that a lot of the infrastructure is missing. So uh, we are. Instance. Uh, well, if you want to be 100% compliant, uh, you know, you can rely on some of the vendors, uh, but, but if you want to do it in a compliant and efficient way, you just have to build it. So the way we look at this is uh, we've got uh, a compliance and engineering first culture at the company. We build all of this stuff in-house, but we're also thinking about uh, having other, uh, making it available to other companies in the ecosystem so that we can drive the growth of the entire space, not just our own. Mm -hmm. Let me just make a quick note that uh, we are also taking questions from the floor through the Slido app. So if you uh, identify the session in the Slido app, um, then, then we'll, we'll see those questions up here. Um, and then l let's talk about um, this other kind of quite old school use case. Uh, people in Bitcoin back in you know, 2013 and 14 remember something called change tip which was a way to uh, send micropayments to, to, to people on social networks uh, using Bitcoin. Um, and Ask FM uh, is kind of sort of doing something similar, but not quite, right? Can you, can you explain what you guys are doing? Uh, we have a user base of 215 million users, and we're going to introduce our token to our community. So token is going to be used for incentivization of uh, our power users, influencers, bloggers to create the high quality content. So that's uh, the basic idea. So if I want to communicate with uh, uh, some local celebrity from Spain or Italy or wherever, 
uh, I can send a question and uh, attach some tokens. So it's going to be additional motivation to, to those people to answer the questions with pictures or so on and so on. So, and you, you have an existing user base already? Yeah, we have an existing user base, and that's our core idea of our uh, future ICO. We want to bring 215 million users in the world. Um, I think that's one of the unique cases. I see. So, so that sounds a lot more like something like Telegram yeah, exactly. is trying to do with their... Just systems. four times smaller than Telegram, so... A little bit smaller. Yeah, right? A little bit smaller. Like what Kick and, and, and other yeah. chat platforms yeah. are trying to do. Yeah. Interesting. Um, well, we have some questions from, from the floor. Um, do you guys have thoughts on airdrops as a token distribution mechanism to grow your community slash user base? Shala? Well, I think what most entrepreneurs in this space and um, uh, people behind a lot of these token offerings is forgetting that it's not just about the initial user acquisition, it's retention. It's the same thing that happened with you know, the proliferation of apps that we saw, um, that just because you put something in the hands of someone that does not necessarily mean that they're going to uh, be an active user of it. So um, I, I think thinking about not just the, the, um, the distribution of the token, but also the incentive system on how it's going to be used and, and targeting you know, the, the users, the, those um, kind of key users, uh, the active users, uh, is an important piece that I, I feel is missing overall. Um, again, you, you've seen, I mean, we've, it, there are precedents for this, including you know, the apps and, and how many people actually only use five apps, I think, um, out of all the ones that they download. Um, so, so we need to think about proper incentives other than just the distribution. Right. Yeah, our uh, strategy for airdrops is, um, is exactly that. So in order to claim an airdrop, users will have to perform tasks within our app. Uh, so basically, they have incentive to complete it and f get fully onboarded and familiarize themselves with, uh, with our user experience. One of the key features that we have is extremely slick and simple sending of uh, uh, cryptos between users on the Monaco platform. It's, it's instant and it's 100% uh, it's free. And uh, it, it requires zero knowledge of, of what happens in the background. Uh, so it's an extremely powerful use case. So as we uh, uh, plan to add over 100 coins in, in, in the next couple of quarters and uh, to our platform, uh, airdrops are an important strategy to educate uh, our users about this, this phenomenal flow that we've already built. Mm -hmm. And in, in that, on that front, you're competing not just with other uh, uh, crypto companies, right? You're competing with people like uh, Revolut, for example, who are uh, coming from the other direction and they're adding crypto uh, exchange uh, into their cards and in, onto their platform. Is, is that something that you kind of anticipated would happen? Did you think you would have to compete against those guys? Uh, we love what Revolut has done over the last few years for the entire fintech uh, industry. They're a great company. And uh, the, uh, some of the stuff that we announced uh, uh, a year ago, uh, like you know, a metal card with a crypto cashback, they just rec recently introduced into their offering. So I think it's a huge compliment to what we are doing. Um, and I think that for a company that's 100% focused on crypto, the way you build up your product, how you market it, is different compared to kind of like a broadline fintech uh, challenger bank. So uh, it's just a little bit different. Yeah, we should talk about marketing uh, a little later in the, in the session. Um, Maxim, I wanted to ask you, so, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, David Marcus, uh, is leading a blockchain group at Facebook now, and uh, there's a lot of speculation about how, what use cases uh, Facebook will, will deploy with, you know, potentially with tokens, so we, we don't know, we're just speculating, but I, I'm just wondering if, if you had thoughts on that. Uh, within a social network like that, what, what would be a good use case for, for tokens? I believe um, in most cases it's gonna be uh, currency, internal currency, uh, so just like Telegram did, uh, that's going to be used for uh, paying for ads, for uh, promoting your profile, uh, promoting your banner or whatever. So that's the basic idea, I think, how Facebook can go. Mm -hmm. So just payment, payment yeah. Pay rails, payment. basically? Like own, own, uh, own currency. 
I don't Let's just think about the potential here. If this actually happens and Facebook enables user-to-user -user payments using crypto, whatever crypto that, that's going to be, uh, this space will grow massively within space of, uh, of, of a few weeks. We've got 20, 30, maybe 40 million cryptocurrency holders globally right now. Uh, it's still a super tiny portion of the population. Uh, the fact that large players uh, like Facebook even think about it and look at this space in detail, uh, I think it's, it's, it's great for crypto in general. And if it really happens, the space is going to explode. I mean, I, I agree with that, but I think we have to be careful here because it, we're, we're talking about uh, changing user behavior. Um, we're also talking about changing company culture. Uh, if you look at a lot of the, comp the tech companies that have been built or, or reached a lot of scale in the last 10, 15 years, it, it's based on uh, siloed data. And um, blockchain crypto is kind of the opposite of that. I think the true value is going to come from interoperability of these different tokens and, and um, uh, current data as currency, uh, but not in siloed ways. Uh, so while I think it's great that we have some of these incumbents looking at this, we can't underestimate the cultural change that will happen, have to happen within those four walls, and, as well as the user uh, behavior um, of those installed platforms that will have to change. And I want to add that I would love to see how Facebook would add this uh, currency, uh, because in the end we don't see any cases right now where the crypto on blockchain is useful for an application. In, uh, in back big masses. So if Facebook will find a good idea or Telegram or Ask.fm will find a good way to interact and connect the huge database and uh, the cryptocurrency and blockchain, it will be uh, perfect for everyone, for community for, and for the all people. Right. W wouldn't it be ironic if Mark Zuckerberg f found out the killer app for crypto and helped to scale it? That yeah. would be incredible. Yeah. Um, I think the, the other issue that should be mentioned here is that the promise of decentralization is, uh, is at the very core of uh, what, we, what all of us, uh, what we do here, right? So uh, this technology gives us an opportunity to avoid situations like we had in the last few months with Facebook in the future, uh, to avoid uh, uh, this, this future where you have zero privacy uh, and where uh, one party controls what's going on. So I think this, I agree with you that, the, that there's, there needs to happen a, fundamental shift in, in, in terms of uh, company culture for this to happen in a positive way. Yeah. Um, I want to talk quickly, return to the point of marketing of uh, some of these uh, ICOs and tokens. Um, do we think that the marketing uh, or the claims made by some, by some token issuers has outpaced uh, what has been delivered? Um, and I'm going to put you on the spot uh, f first, uh, Maxim. So your, your company recently sponsored an expedition to uh, the summit of Mount Everest. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, tragically, uh, on the way down, somebody, a Sherpa, uh, uh, went missing and is now presumed dead. Uh, do, you, do you regret, for example, uh, uh, sponsoring such a high-risk endeavor with, with your token sale? First of all, I want to say that this is a very sad story. It's a big tragedy. tragedy. Um, yeah, so we are like um, any other big companies are we're sponsoring the uh, extreme event. Uh, of course, um, we understand that, uh, uh, so for example, Google or Red Bull does the same usually. And uh, this is the mountains, uh, it, uh, it can happen. Unfortunately, it happened with uh, Sherpa. It's, um, this n not all media knows the full story how it happened. I can talk about it for, for an hour because I was uh, deeply involved on, in investigation what happened over there. So, uh, But in the end, of course, uh, we would not do that if we would know that this will happen. If you could go back to before you made the decision to sponsor, would you... Have sponsored? No. No. Um, and, and Chris, I wanted to ask you, based, Bloomberg wrote a story about your company a few, a few months ago talking about uh, a, a deal that you had in place with Visa to issue your card. Uh, and the assertion of the story was that you didn't have the deal in place uh, at the time that you marketed uh, uh, this, this card. Um, um, do, do you think you would have been more cautious in terms of how you approach that? 
Well, first of all, the, the article was factually incorrect because at the time when it was released on October 2nd, I believe, we already had a fully approved program by Visa. All right, so that's, that's the first thing. It was a, a sensationalist uh, 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 article, uh, but it was factually incorrect. Right? Um, I think, generally speaking, entrepreneurs are always optimistic with, uh, about timelines, what they can deliver in a given timeline. And you can see that there's a lot of uh, promises being made you know, uh, before and after ICOs by all different projects. I think this is not much different comparing to what you saw uh, in, uh, in the, in the dot-com boom days. Right? There were businesses where they were just in concept stage uh, and they overpromised and delivered. Uh, for us, we do our very best to do the opposite. We underpromise, and if you look at the product right now versus a year ago when we started our ICO, it's much stronger. Uh, the team is, that we put together is absolutely incredible and we've never been in a better position. Uh, so uh, I think being conservative pays off uh, for the long run, uh, but without being optimistic, entrepreneurs would never start in the first place. So you think the marketing was justified? Well, you know, we've been working on this for, uh, at the time of the ICO for a year, right? Uh, so we have we had uh, LOI signed, we had been sponsorship agreements signed, and we didn't flaunt uh, the visa name as was implied in that Bloomberg article at all. In fact, if you look back, we only started uh, uh, displaying visa logos on the website after we got our card art approved in October, right, uh, last year. So I think we've, we've done okay on this front, and we managed this reasonably well, explaining to the uh, to the community what the product is about. Uh, without, uh, uh, you know, going around visa rules. You know, our point of view is that compliance is our core competence, and we have to respect uh, the guidelines of our partners, including, uh, in some cases, NDAs that we've signed. Uh, and we couldn't even communicate with the reporter at that time openly because there was a, we were under NDA, right? So that's. I'm just mindful of time. I just want to give uh, John yeah. a quick... Yeah, well, as I, I started my venture career in 99 out in Silicon Valley, and so I lived through the 99 to um, 2001, 2003 time frame out in Silicon Valley as, as an investor. And um, I think what we're seeing, what we saw last year kind of was, was beyond what we saw in the late 90s um, in, in terms of the kind of the the lack of regulation, complete lack of regulation. Uh, we actually, uh, my fund did not participate in ICOs last year uh, because very few actually passed our diligence test. Um, I've been an investor for a long time. We get to know the entrepreneur. Uh, we're fiduciaries to our limited partners. Um, and, and we just, when we dug into some of these, uh, uh, these offerings, there just wasn't enough there or there wasn't as much as they were portraying, which, you know, we now see the regulators coming after that. Now, I, I'm happy that we're moving to a more kind of self-regulated world because I do believe in tokens, but um, I, I don't think we're going to serve anyone, um, you know, if, if uh, or we're going to be detriment to the industry if we start, you know, not delivering on the promises uh, or, or stating facts that just are, you know, incorrect. And that goes for the media as well as the entrepreneurs. Well, we have gone over time. So uh, thank you very much to my panelists and thanks to all of you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.